Rorschach's Journal, October 12, 1985. Dog carcass and alley. Tire tread on burst stomach. This city's afraid of me. I've seen its true face. Criminals are a cowardly... No! In brightest day and black... No! With great power comes great responsibility? This episode of iFanboy is brought to you by GoDaddy.com and Netflix.com. Welcome to iFanboy, the comic book discussion show. My name is Connor. I'm here with... I'm Ron. And I'm Josh. Watchmen. Watchmen. I know. This, is the, what, this is the year of the Watchmen. What do I need to say? Uh, the, the movie will be out very, very soon. Uh, it is, if not the greatest graphic novel of all time, then certainly... The most in, acclaimed. Yeah, in the upper echelon. Um, it's highly anticipated film release. And we've, we've, we've talked about Alan Moore. We've talked about some of that work. We've never actually... We talked a little bit about Watchmen in our first episode in our top five show. Yeah, 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 yeah. But only a few minutes. So we thought we should really sort of focus on it since the movie's out. But everyone's talking about it. Yep. People who've never read a comic are talking about Watchmen. And it, and it could be very... I mean, when the trailer came out, the the book shot up to the on the Amazon charts. It was like the number two best-selling book. Not just comic yeah. or graphic novel, but book. Um, and Watchmen can be a little intimidating for a lot of a lot of new readers and things like that people haven't read it before. I have I've long said that this is not a book that to to me seems like a good beginner comic book. No. <laughs> and I think that it rewards the reader on on further reading. The first time there's so much expectation, there's so much yep. acclaim and hype built up about it. It's been built up to such a big level. Um and I and I you hear that a lot. People are like, "Well, I read yeah. it. I don't know if I But if you keep reading it again, I know that that sounds, you know, but but it really is worth it. But um Let's, I suppose we should talk a little about what Watchmen actually is. Uh, it's got it's got a storied history. It's definitely a, a unique story in in comic books. Why don't you? Uh, okay. Give the basics. Uh, uh, so so you might have heard of Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons. Alan Moore, a uh, comic book writer. Dave Gibbons, comic book artist. Both British. Uh, they did a lot of work in England. Uh, you know, 2000 AD. They were together. Like they, in worked together in 2000 AD. Um, and they were starting to come over across the pond, do some work for DC Comics. Um, Alan Moore had had a big success with uh, Swamp Thing. Yep, Swamp Thing. First. As well as um, as as he was starting to get more into the superhero stuff, he he had done over in England. He did um, uh, Marvel Man, yeah, which was uh, which was the kind of reinterpretation of the Captain Marvel character. Um, so you know he was uh, Dave Gibbons was working on Green Lanterns, and Alan Moore was doing backup stories here and there with superheroes, mm-hmm. and then ultimately Alan Moore went and did this the last Superman story before the reboot. Right. Um, whatever happened to the Man of Tomorrow? Right. Uh, but so they were talking. They wanted to do a book together. Uh, they wanted to do a book together, and then also DC wanted Alan Moore to do another book, not just backup stories, but another series because Swamp Thing was very acclaimed. He was clearly an, an, a writer on the rise. So they said, "Pitch us another pro- project." And so he and Dave Gibbons pitched a bunch of different projects. Yeah. They were all DC didn't like, you know, as it goes when you pitch things, they don't all get accepted. But eventually, they came down to they wanted to do a group story, a group superhero story. Well, it started off with a with a they wanted to do a Superman story. Right. Um, they they had for some reason they picked up on a mad uh, parody of Superman called Super Duper Man, and they wanted that was very the comedic aspect of Superman, and they wanted to do that in a hundred eighty degrees different direction and do a more kind of uh, serious, not less comedic Superman story that grew into a kind of a Justice League story. Um, so eventually, they they had this idea of doing a team superhero story, and then that became well, they had. Um, DC had all these different characters they'd acquired. Yeah. Acquired characters from other companies. Throughout the, yeah, throughout the history, there have been comic companies that have went under, and DC and Marvel both have bought the characters. That's how, the how DC ended up with, with the Fawcett characters. Captain yeah. Marvel. Exactly. Harry Marvel. And so, um, in 1985, DC had bought the Charlton Comics characters, which were, Charlton was a great series of comics in the 60s and 70s. Uh, Steve Ditko did a lot of work for them. A lot Question. of Roy, Roy Thomas, I think, did some stuff, you know, like some great stuff. And they bought the rights to all those characters, and they were kind of sitting on it. They didn't know what to do with it. And Alan Moore had wanted to do another reinterpretation, a la what he did on Marvel Man, where if you look at the original Captain Marvel and Marvel Man, they were completely, yeah. you know, the same, you know, kind of archetype, but completely different characters, different sort of things. So he so, wanted to take these characters, and he and he talked about um, in in this book. He actually wrote this an essay. He wrote about um, which book in the Watchmen. The yeah. Absolute. Well, yeah. he, he wrote it at the time it came out, and it's included right. in the Absolute. But I believe it's in that one too. He wanted to do a story where it wasn't encumbered by continuity, where yeah. he wasn't limited by what was going on in other books. He could do whatever he wanted and have full control over the whole world. 
And, it's, and so that, that was the reason why he wanted to take these characters that were uh, in a bubble and they weren't being affected by like Batman and Superman, so he was excited about that. And for whatever reason, DC decided not to let him use the Charlton characters. They, they became an, an interpretation of those Charlton characters. So if you look at the, the Watchmen as a team, although they never really are a team, you know, type that, team, yeah, that's no. never actually used. Right, the exactly. word Watchmen is used in the book. Yeah, this, it is, this, but not, but not as a to refer, refer to, the to themselves. Right. Right. Yeah. The, the crime busters. Crime busters. Yeah, which, is... which never took off the grind. But wait, so if you look at if we break and, the, and then the Minutemen before that. The Minutemen. Right, yes. I mean, the group that we yeah. follow in the book. We, right. Also, if this is called Crime Busters, no, not nearly as epic. No, as... Watchmen is great. I remember in the '80s seeing the the publicity posters for this and that "Who watches the Watchmen?" Mm -hmm. You know, kind of phrase. Awesome he marketing campaign, right? And the um and the and the little happy face with the little trickle of blood. Great book. iconography. But so if we break down the characters that are in the Watchmen, um, so what you got is the the of the main characters. You've got the comedian, um, who is the guy with the American flag on his shoulders and the mustache and the cigar. Domino mask. He's actually um, based on a Charlton character called the Peacemaker, um, with a little bit of Nick Fury influence in there, um, right, but not the, officially. The yeah. CIA sort of yeah. soldier type. Exactly. There's Doctor Manhattan, who is the Captain Adam character, and um, he is the other world, the only one with actual superpowers. Yeah. And he's he's the ac accidental superhero. Which... Ca yeah, Captain Adam was you know had a horrible accident happened to him. He had to wear the containment suit, yeah. that sort of thing. So Doctor Manhattan has similar kind of origin. They go in different directions though, yeah. as far as the character arcs. Um, Night Owl uh, mm -hmm. is an is an analog of a uh, Blue Beetle. Yep. Uh, you know Blue Beetle probably because he ended up in the DC universe proper. He's just a well, guy. Well, all these people did end up in the DC. Yeah, universe just a guy proper. with a bunch. But you've seen a lot of Blue Beetle. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he ended up in the JLA. A guy yes. with a lot of uh, money and gadgets, yep. basically. And smarts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very smart. That's true. Uh, then you got the you got Ozymandias, who is kind of like the uh, kind of like the Superman esque. I don't know, but um, uh, he was based on Peter Cannon Thunderbolt, which is a Charlton character. Who was a character who Alan Moore liked him because he used his hundred percent of his brain capacity, and he liked that idea as a as a premise. Well, that's perfect for Alan Moore. Yeah, totally. Um, Rorschach, probably the most famous and most popular mm -hmm. character in Watchmen, if you judge by any kind of yeah, you know. Uh, on scientific poll. When we when we met, we saw Dave Gibbons at a convention. Everybody asked for a Rorschach sketch. So yeah. that's, I got a Night Owl sketch. I got a Green Lantern. I mean, that's a whole other story. I, mean, <laughs> I want to go back and not get Rorschach. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get I want to get original yeah. uh, Night Owl. Night Owl. Yeah. Uh, Rorsch, Rorschach is is uh, based on the question and a little bit of Mr. A in there, but he's a he's a both characters uh, created by Steve Ditko. And Steve Ditko was an Ayn Rand. Uh, follower and he believed in uh, absolute objectivism and and you can see that oh, in we very, Rorschach. We got very heady all of a sudden. <laughs> well, I, I I learned about it. I may as well yeah. share it. You know, for what and, and, and Rorschach says many times, there's no compromise. Lives a life compromise. Lives a life without compromise. And, yeah. and and you know that's clearly there. Yep. And then finally, there's Silk Spectre, who was um, based on the character Nightshade, but um, Alan Moore felt as if he needed like a Black Canary esque kind of female character, female lead in that way. So, um, so that breaks down the characters of the Watchmen and where you have the origins of what they, you know, of what you know, who they were going to be. You know, the comedian. Um, and I thought it was really interesting because there's a long history of these characters. You go back to the Golden Age with the Minutemen, and it's interesting to see them evolve. Like the comedian starts off, he's the comedian, you know, he and he's like kind of sixteen or seventeen yeah. years old. Yeah, and he's in his yellow yellow suit, yellow suit and he's kind of making jokes. And then as his character evolves, he becomes this commando esque, you know, like with weapons and things like that. So it's interesting to see the history of the characters that Moore and Gibbons broke down with the characters in terms of how they got to where they were when the story picks up in 1985. Um, so the first issue of Watchmen was published in September 1986, uh, the seminal com changing the world of comics. Um, I wasn't around for it, but for all intents and purposes, this uh, this was a big, big deal at the yeah. time. And you'll hear people uh, a little older than me, you know, will talk about. I've, I've heard Brubaker talk about how Ed Brubaker uh, talk about how you know, like the, those issues coming out was a big deal. Yeah. When when Alan Moore went to San Diego that year, it was a big deal. Yeah. You know. Um, so they started publishing in September 86, and the 12-issue uh, miniseries ended in October 1987. Um, important note, we were talking about this before, uh, The Dark Knight, which is, uh, which is a Batman story that Frank Miller did, which is also kind of Watchmen and Dark Knight, it held hand-in-hand hand as changing the comics. The 86 yeah. uh, shift to grim and gritty. Yeah, Dar Dark Knight was published in February of 86 and was done by June of 86. So Dark Knight was done and, and in the can before Watchmen even started, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I always thought of them as going kind of at the same time, so yeah. that's kind of interesting. Still an amazing year, think yeah, about that. Yeah, think, oh, jeez, yeah. So before we, before we get into the story, we should probably, I mean, pe people who are just new to comics who haven't read the book may be wondering why is it so important? What is it about this this book that people still talk about? Mm -hmm. It's still, its influence is still felt in yeah. almost every superhero book you're reading right now from the major publishers. 
what is it about what Watchmen did that that made it so important? Do you think? It's a, I, I think it's the. I don't know. I mean, well, I think well, there are two. There are two schools of thought. One is that it's a it's a deconstructionist story, and mm-hmm. that it, it deconstructs the idea of superheroes and people, um, and, and the superhero stories that are being told, and which ties into the second thing, which is it was one of the first, you know, because you're coming out of the Silver Age, you know, nineteen eighty, you know, nineteen eighty six was by that point, the Silver Age was a time period of starting in the late fifties up until about the early eighties, mm-hmm. where a lot of the stories were very. Very simple. Very, you had a lot of the stuff that was done by Stan Lee on the Marvel side, and you had the Flash and Justice League and things like that. And stories were becoming more and more complex as the '70s and '80s were going through. And what happened was that Moore was able to take these characters and show them, you know, what was great about them and what was horrible about them. That these are people. They might be superheroes, but they have flaws, they have problems, and they have, you know, as great things they have about them, they have equally bad things about them. Well, the, uh, deconstruction is a term that gets used a lot, and, and I don't know if I know the. I don't, I don't even know if there is an exact uh, definition for what it is that everybody would agree on. But if you look at it in, in the terms of this, um, also in a movie like Unforgiven, what you do is you take the archetype of a superhero who is a person who is who's good, who has uh, no problems, who can who can deal with anything. Superman. Um, and you, and you, you say, okay, well, wait a minute. What if we look at them later on down the road when they're not so sure of themselves and you look at the other side of them as like, do they, do they have trouble with their love life? Do they? You really look at, at what that is as a human being and you break it down and you take away the sheen, uh, yeah. the unrealistic idea of what it is, and, and that's what this book does. In, in addition to the environment they live in, in, you know, at this point, the world of comics was very embracing and celebrating the heroes, you know, like, yay, Superman, and yay, the Avengers, and things like that. This is a world that hates superheroes. They passed a law making them illegal. In 1977, yeah. the, the Keen Act, I believe, uh, was passed, and, and, and superheroes were, were banned except for the comedian. Who is who is a, a government operative and and Dr. Manhattan who is a government who's a living weapon yeah government. right and Rorschach who refused to quit well he was banned he just didn't yeah quit. he was yeah he was he, um, what's yeah. interesting what what you think about one of the influences is that it, it took the realism aspect that Marvel introduced and and did it for real yeah, yeah. like when Marvel's touting the realness of oh, Super Spider Man campaigns rent is it was a, more of a surfacey thing this is like really superheroes with problems. Rorschach is, in, you know, is insane comedian, is so, sociopath. Like, yep. these are what would you, what would ha- the whole idea people talk about is watching this. What would happen if these people were real? Mm-hmm. And the, the, the main point is they would mostly be crazy. Yeah, because yeah. Because it would take a crazy person to put on a costume right. and go out. These aren't superheroes. Only one person in this book has superpowers. Everybody else is just a normal person. They're costumed adventurers, and yeah. and the characters <laughs> sort of make no secret about the fact that that's silly. The, one of the nice framing devices in the book is the the sections from Hollis Mason, who is the original Night Owl, his book. Yeah. Um, it sets up a lot of context and how he looked at it and he, you know, he understands there's a creepy sexual subtext to some of it. There's a there's power just, thing. Yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's just a weirdness and he yeah. knows that and they say it. Yeah. That is very rarely, or at least was very rarely hinted at in, in comic books at the time. Certainly not DC comic and that's books. That's one of the influences that this book has is that it took the idea that like every book now is exploring the dark side of the superhero mm-hmm. what it's like to you know what is you know the not what how it affects their lives and the, and the love lives and things like that and that's something that really Alan Moore uh, introduced not introduced but really f- focused on in this book well he had done it in in Marvel Man or Miracle yeah. Man but um, what this had that that didn't have was a really impressive overall structure of a complete story from beginning to end yeah. In, in a world that was entirely realized um, and we should get into all of that stuff and what we liked about it and what we didn't after the break. Web hosting from GoDaddy.com includes 99.9% uptime, 24-7 support, and free access to hosting connection, the place to install over 30 free applications sure to help you get the most out of your hosting plan and website. If you want to make an impact online, GoDaddy.com has what you need. .com names as low as $199 plus world-class hosting, fast and easy website builders, and much more. Keep your personal information away from spammers, hackers, and your crazy ex-roommate. Private domain registration from GoDaddy.com protects your privacy by keeping your address, phone number, and more out of the public database. GoDaddy.com makes it easy to customize your own virtual, dedicated server. Choose one of our three popular plans or select your own Linux or Windows server with all the plan options you need. Looking to drive viewers to your video content? Then get a .tv domain name and stand out from the crowd. .tv domains are perfect for podcasters, video bloggers, or anyone with something to say. And they're available now at GoDaddy.com. It's quite a story. We should probably warn everyone. We're going to talk about the story both in what happens and how it happens. So if you haven't read it, spoilers. This section, huh. this middle section, is going to be the story spoilers part. So if you yeah. haven't read it, you don't want to spoil. Skip, skip to the next break, um, yeah. and we'll talk about some other stuff. But now we're going to talk about the story. The central story is it opens with a murder. Yeah. 
And Al Moore said he wanted to start a story with a famous character getting murdered and then then having the repercussions. It opens with a comedian getting killed. Or he's dead. He's dead on the first page already. So someone threw him out his window. And that's where we go. We go from there. Murder, yeah. mis- murder mystery. It's really it's a murder mystery. Yeah, basically. And so and so from there, what happens is that uh, Rorschach uh, uh, investigates it and starts putting together the pieces and realizing that you know maybe somebody's coming after us, caped you know kind of heroes. And so he starts you know spreading the word to the uh, night owl who's retired, uh, to Doctor Manhattan who lives with the Silk Spectre. Um, they're in a relationship. Um, he goes to Osmandius and he says, hey, you know, I'm looking at the writing on the wall. I think someone's coming after us. Um, and so it's kind of Rorschach's paranoia that kind of sets off the the the, the story. Yeah, um, and and no one believes him. And then over the course of times, you find out that the the the, the mastermind behind it is. Uh, well, you're jumping right to the end, aren't you? Well, I mean, well like, like some of the context is that at the same time you've got a uh, 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 rocky political. The world is on escalating a, political escal- tensions. Yeah, so Richard Nixon is still president. He um, which is. W- he, in this world, he, he they won Vietnam because of uh, Dr. Manhattan, so that changed the, the landscape for Nixon, who... And also, who, also the comedian killed Wood, Wood, Woodward Bernstein. So oh, that, did he? I think yeah. I missed Yeah, that. so yes. Watergate didn't happen. Oh. And he also assassinated... <laughs> wow, JFK. I've never heard that. He also assassinated JFK, yeah. so that... Wow. Yeah. Uh, and so Nixon... Nixon, Nixon is, passes legislation so that he can be elected over and over and over again. Yeah. But uh, not so just that, because of, through the comedian, he is he has helped right. sway over yeah. the country since the and 1960s. S- and the comedian was really kind of modeled after a G. Gordon Liddy kind of character as Although well, he's too. in the book, too. Yeah, yeah true. Yeah. yeah, he is. But, um, but so what happens, so the world is, the world is on edge, uh, uh, conflict with China is, and no, Russia. Russia. Uh, Russia, Russia is, on, is on the verge. Yeah. Soviet's on the verge. Nuclear war is on the horizon everybody you know, well, there's a lot of nuclear fear they're in all yeah. in afghanistan it's yeah. all it's it's, it's kind of creepy at how but this is know. also an, it's a comment on on what the world was like when they were writing this in 1984 yeah. because you know the soviets and we're in afghanistan, afghanistan. Yeah, exactly. you know, it's all it's all happening right there so in the yeah. background and it's interesting how it tells the tale through almost through newspaper, newspaper headlines and tv headlines in the oh. background you can follow that story through what papers are being read? And what it's you get like. a real feeling for what the world is like while you're reading this, without knowing explicitly. And about it's a, what's going it's on. because it takes place in 1985. Uh, the the world has actually been altered slightly because of the presence of, of uh, John Osterman, Doctor Manhattan. He's uh, he's enabled technology to to make huge advances because basically he can do anything. Um, he's complete control over atoms. He's what Firestorm should be yeah. if he was real, yeah. but he's not. Um, he's got he can, it, he can synthesize any. Uh, Stuff. Use the similar theme that Heroes picked up on the idea of the watch. He was, his father was a watch repairman. He learned how to fix watches, mm-hmm. and so from that you see him, de- you know, deconstructing things and putting them back together. Yeah. And that's he can do that down to the atomic level. So, so he brought in the electric car. Yeah. Everything is everything is heightened. Oh, it's still a very grit, gritty and grim, grimy world. The, yeah. the, the idea sort of being that all of these beautiful, amazing technological advances didn't do anything to to make quality of life better. In fact. There's, there's like, I think I read somewhere in the notes. There's no disease. There's nothing. So people don't really have anything to live for. Yeah. Um, and it's creating discontent everywhere. And and everybody's under the threat of nuclear war. They yeah. all think they're gonna die. They're, you know, the end is near. It's a doomsday clock. It's yeah, all, exactly. It's, like a, it's, it's almost at midnight. And so now what you've got is you've got, you know, so the comedian dies, and Rorschach starts asking questions and starts looking into it. And then at some point, um, Rorschach gets arrested. They finally he gets framed. Um, and uh, Night Owl and um, what's her name, Silk Spectre. Uh, decide to don their costumes again and break them out of prison, and that's where things kind of start start moving. And, and so the this, ball gets rolling. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's just this giant, complicated plot that seems to be very straightforward and seems to be about one thing, and is is incredibly deep. I love the idea of of that they, there's a world that's been built, but there's also been a past and a history that's been built, and all the supplemental materi- materials, the stuff that comes yep. in between the chapters. Build into that and, and the it also history helps tell, of what it tell is. A story. Yes, it, it is very it, important. It re- reveals a lot of stuff that happens to the characters. Mm-hmm. Before we get to the ending, I want to say that, um, and I'm not complaining because it was at least five or six years after this book came out, but I, I totally had the ending ruined for me by Wizard Magazine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Me too. They, they, at, some point in the mid, at some point in the early to mid 90s, they did one of those um, top 15 shocking moments in comics. Yeah. <laughs> and number one was the reveal of the killer. Yeah. And, uh, and I hadn't read Watchmen yet at that yeah. point, and I went, all right. So, so are we going to do that to some other people? or are we, uh? It doesn't matter because it's not the point. Right. And I think that one of the things that it does really interestingly at the end is that they don't, again, in, in the deconstruction aspect, they don't find the killer and say, bring him to justice. we will bring you to justice. They weigh, they weigh everything that happens. Well, Rorschach says that. Well, Rorschach then right. uh, gets dealt with. Yeah. And in one of the 
one of the saddest panels I've ever seen in my life. Uh, the thing is, Rorschach starts off and you're like, this guy's funny, you know, because he's yeah. so, and then after a little while you see that he's really sad and then yeah. you start to be a little scared of him and then in the end you feel bad for him, yeah. Yeah. which is a really, really interesting roller coaster to take you on with that He's character. my favorite character throughout the whole thing. I mean, like, he's, he's great. I he's mean, you know. the most fleshed out. Right. Um, well, I like Ayn Rand too, so. Well, <laughs> You're wrong. Um, <laughs> you know, Dan Dreberg is, is sort of the night everyman uh, in the middle of the Night Owl. And, and while you kind of think you want to like him, he's kind of silly. Yeah. And he knows it. And he's kind of painted that way. Like, he's lonely. And he doesn't have anything to live for. You know, Rorschach has this really just interesting past. And, and I think it's, it's just a shot of what can happen to somebody. Right. You know? So, um, are we going to reveal the end? Or Let's not reveal the kill. Yeah, no, no, we'll reveal it. You go read it, you'll see it's what not, happens. It's not important. But, but really. so, so, it's a great story, but what's also one of the reasons why Watchmen is such an important important book is because comics are a visual medium, and so the approach that Dave Gibbons and Alan Moore took from the visual angle of storytelling is also deconstructing the way comic books are made and all that kind of stuff. If you flip through the pages of it, and there's a lot of supplemental material in the Absolute Edition, which mm-hmm. I strongly recommend, um, as well as in the new book, Watching the Watchmen, that Dave Gibbons just put out. Yep. Um, but if you look at it, it's all based on a nine panel grid the page yeah. every page is based on a nine panel grid so some pages um, break out of that and they, they, you know, they got more than nine panels less than nine panels but it's always based on this simple you combine three, three, or, three grid. Yeah. Yeah, you combine yeah. you combine the three on the bottom to make one long one or whatever it's a great um, storytelling device because when yeah. you break out of that it yeah. hits you yes because mm-hmm. yep. you go along nine panels nine panels and they do it at a a big half page panel and you're yep. gonna boom it's it has, usually a big moment it has effort. And, and it totally gets you and then throughout that there are also little subtle subtle hints and clues that are told to the story like for example um, when Dan Dryberg Night, Night Owl goes to visit um, the old Night Owl he um, the original Night Owl he's now a mechanic and has an auto body shot and there's a sign in front of there's, it's the same panel every time he goes to visit him and that same sign about we repair broken down whatever you know, it, which is a you know, contextual to the character, yeah. mm-hmm. which is just which is amazing. Um, and additionally, they did things like you know, issue five, all the pages are symmetrical. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you look at them, the panel layouts, they, they they work not only within the page and the panels, but within the double page spreads. And and I'll say, when I first read this, I didn't pick up on a lot of that. I didn't know yeah. what I was looking at, and I really I thought at first, I was like, oh, the art's kind of standard. It's kind yeah. of boring. Simple. And and, yeah. and I think that this is one of those things that. It doesn't hit you right away the first time. You got to keep going back, and then you start to notice things. Really, the the first time I read it again mm-hmm. was really the first time that I started to really appreciate and, this. And and don't mean to be like kind of you know oh you know you got to be an old reader or whatever. But at, the longer you read comics, the, the, the more, more appreciate you appreciate it. this is an this is an artistic achievement. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, once you understand the form and structure, and you read things like understanding comics by Scott McCloud, and you get really into the process of things, you realize that this is immensely the production of this was immensely complicated. Even reading yeah. it again for the show, yeah. I don't know, maybe it's the thirtieth time I've read it. Even yeah. now, I've picked up on more, more things and yeah. new things, and yeah. that's the amazing. It's so dense. Well, and if you look at the production of it, um, the, the joke is, and it's in the, uh, the examples in the Absolute Edition. Alan Moore delivered the script to issue one to Dave Gibbons. It was 101 pages for a 28-page comic book. 101 pages, single-spaced, no breaks of just describing it. That's because Alan Moore is crazy. Yeah, there it is. It's right there. It's just, Alan Moore is crazy. It's just, and it's just so detailed, now, and Gibbons was able to pick up on that detail and carry that over to the art. Now, to, to be fair, you know, also in oh, absolute, there's, a, there's, a, there's the last page. Yeah. It's yeah. about a page and a half. Yeah. Fair, so fair, there fair. was a lot of setting up. I mean, they yeah. worked on this developing the look, the feel, the every yeah. single bit of it for a long time. The yeah. colors are very evocative. They're very yeah. The, co- the color. John Higgins yeah. Yeah. Uh, is a guy whose name doesn't get used enough. It to should. Be talking about this. Yeah. And so much of this book has to do with the look of it. Um, yeah. to also. Yeah. Do you have a favorite section? Favorite favorite chapter? Uh, that's a um, I I think you and I were talking about this before where the um. The, the, when, well, when each, each character gets basically an issue. Yeah. yeah. Where, yeah. where through the, which is brilliant, through the story that you learn about their backstory. Yeah. When we were talking about the Dr. Manhattan issue. When Dr. Manhattan goes to yeah. Mars and he is, the, the idea is that he is not a human. He does not experience life as we do. So for him, all time converges at the same time. So yeah. what is happening now is also what was happening then. It's he all knows. happening. And yeah. happening in the future. Yes. Yeah. It's, everything is written in the present tense. Yeah. Um, well, because he describes time as a jewel. Yeah. And yeah. we only see one side, but it has multi sides. If you can see them all. But it's all basically it's three things happening at once, mm-hmm. yeah. and his his past story, his future, and what's happening to him now, all happening simultaneously in this in this one issue, and it's 
mind blowing in how well Alan Moore pulls off this complicated structure, and you can follow yeah. it, mm-hmm. yep. and it, it makes sense. But it also better better than anything I've ever read in a comic book. Yeah, yeah. You know, it makes you if you've ever tried to write anything, it makes you feel incredibly lazy. The other yeah. part that I really like is, <laughs> yes. I, like I said, I love the development of Rorschach throughout the whole thing, yeah. and the, the issue um, after um, Silk Spectre is, is taken away by by, by Doctor Manhattan to go to Mars. And, and uh, Rorschach and Night Owl are alone together for a little while, waiting to go find out where they're going and what they're going to do. I really I love the character development and interaction in that. Yeah. Um, where where uh, Night Owl is the only character who, who Rorschach actually... Likes. Yeah, and right responds now. to like a human. And, like yeah. Every once in a while, he sort of his, his humanity cracks through a little bit. Um, one of the things about Rorschach that I, I just wanted to mention really quick is, uh, at a certain point in the past, he cracks... Like he goes, some, he's a really something, bad case, and he's, something he happens. And the and kidnapping case, right? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. if you look, uh, flashbacks of him having with regular uh, word balloons, yeah. and he speaks like a normal human. And at some point, um, now the in the present, the yeah. lettering is all wavy, it's and it, jagged, it, it indicates yeah. it. Well, that's what it's. Yeah. That's what it makes you think. Yeah. And so when I first heard the voice they used for the movie, for example, yeah. that sounded like what I thought it was because of the way that the letters were. Yeah. So even the lettering. Um, yeah. was, was a way of telling the story in this book and you don't notice it yeah. you know, until you're like starting to examine what it is that's good well, about it. Well it's funny because in, in, in Alan Moore's closing essay in this he says when I finished this I realized I was done with superheroes. Yeah. And it, he wasn't. He did, he did superheroes some more after but basically it's true. Yeah. <laughs> Anything you could possibly do in a superhero story he, he, did. he did it in Watchmen he's, yeah. and he did it better than anybody has done it and he'll, no one will ever do it as good so yeah. he's like I'm done. He finished yeah. it. I'm, I'm done with superheroes. Unless you want to pay me a million dollars to do uh, Wildcats, in which case. <laughs> <laughs> they would. So um, so the book comes out. It's a resounding success. It, it, even at, It's one of those rare things where even at the time people realized what, what, what it was. Mm-hmm. Um, and then from there it's been, you know, it's been a rocky history. And yeah. so when we come back from this break, we'll tell you about what happened. Thanks to Netflix for sponsoring this episode of iFanboy. With Netflix, you can rent over 90,000 titles online, including lots of Blu-ray titles, with free shipping both ways to your home. They now have over 40 shipping centers, so almost all deliveries happen within one business day. And Netflix plans start from $4.99, and as a new member, you can get a no-risk two-week free trial membership if you check out www.netflix.com slash iFanboy, and remember to type in that www and using the code. Fortunately, in the uh, late '80s, Alan Moore had a, began a, seri- a, a series, series of, of falling outs? many falling outs with DC Comics, um, culminating um, in his la- latest one. Right? Yeah, where he refuses to acknowledge anything, and um, and that led to a very <laughs> rocky relationship with DC Comics, who published who published uh, Watchmen. Um, the book has consistently sold over the past twenty five. How was even 25? without yeah. the yeah. movie hype? Every year, it's one of the top ten top seller, yes. mm-hmm. exactly. even without that. Yeah. For, 20 years plus 12, 13 yep. years. Math is hard. And so his, his, his you know, combination of DC problems with his combination with his problems with the movie industry. Well, the movie thing is recent. So right. The, but... the DC problem started it. So what happened was that every time they tried to repackage it or do anything with it, he it just always fell through. There, there's a long story of the, the 15th anniversary. They were going to do a line of action figures. Mm-hmm. And the, the designs were all done. There were sculpts. They I think they were awesome. at the con. They looked awesome. Yeah, those never came out. Uh, he just wouldn't approve it. So um, I don't know the nature of his deal, how much ownership he has of it or whatever. But at a certain point in the 80s, DC had had a very uh, progressive uh, creator ownership deal. So he probably, you know, he definitely gets a back end. So it's funny he does. He's not accepting any. He's not having anything to do with the movie. He doesn't want his. Well, that, that's what he, all goes to Gibbons. Yeah, what he does. Right. What is, so then what happened was with movies in the late '90s, early 2000s, a lot of his properties did make it through, mm-hmm. and you know, so From Hell came out with Johnny Depp and League of Extraordinary Gentlemen with, with Sean Connery, um, and what was the the other one that came out recently? There was another Elmore movie, wasn't there? V for Vendetta. Oh, V for Vendetta, Vendetta, right? And so what he's done is that he signed away all of his rights to any ro- to any royalties related to the movies, and he gave them to the artist. So David Lloyd got all the money for V for Vendetta. Um, you know, Kevin O'Neill got all the money for League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Eddie Campbell. Eddie Campbell got uh, it for From Hell, which is it's freaking like awesome. Lottery, but, yeah, like, exactly. Well, the artist is like, All you yeah. do is get an Alan Moore book. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, the point I was making is that he's, they're still selling a lot of books. Yeah, and exactly. He still yeah. gets royalties from the no, no, books. No, no, totally. Yeah. And so he's, he's okay. So, so, no, yeah. so now this he could is, have some boats. So when this came out in... in I don't the, see that. When this came out in the 80s, it was, a, it was a hot option and a hot property for Hollywood, and there have been rumors and attempts at developing it for the past 20 years or so. Um, Definitely I, attempts. I just remember yeah, I mean, them. Yeah. There was a Sam Ham written script. I that, read that. You know, Josh read. I read ago. some of it, yeah. which was like it, it wasn't there a big fight, like the Statue of Liberty. It was. Sh- like? It was too short. Like it yeah. was just. I don't even remember yeah. the details of it, but it was not right. And then um, T- Terry Gilliam was associated well, with it for a while. He was the director of the yeah, that yeah. script. 
Um, and it's just kind of languished and it's got knocked around. And, and, it, and while it got languished, it got built up to the, you just can't do People would say, you can't make that movie. You can't do it. I was that person. Um, and yeah. I still, I mean, I still am to a right. certain extent. I, I accept that it will get, it is getting made. And, and well, it's I'm, made. It's done. It's done. I know. Yeah, 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 and I'm okay. And I'm okay yeah. with it. Yeah. Like, I'm cool. Yeah. Like, it's not going to, I don't think it's going to ruin the book. Well, 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 before we get to the actual movie, um, there was, I remember in the early 2000s when the whole kind of uh, HBO episodic Sopranos thing started coming out, people were like, they should do Watchmen as Every a... Every comic a, fan you ask would have said, I wanted yeah. that as a Watchmen series. And I read an article in Entertainment Weekly when, when the first movie first started getting filmed, and apparently they, off, they, they, they pitched it to, to the HBO. Mm-hmm. Yeah. HBO didn't want it. Yeah. So Stupid. It's not, don't, don't go cry in the DC and blame yeah. them. They... Yeah. They pitched it as a 12, yeah, right. 12 episode mini. It's yeah. the same company, HBO and, and well, you know, it's it's was it was corporate structure. Yeah. Um, but so so then somehow co- coming off of the success of 300, 300 Zack Snyder comes into the picture, and honestly, I don't know, and I, I looked into I, it stuff like that how it ended up in his place. I believe the rumor. Yeah, yeah, I believe yeah. the the way that I heard it, and this is you know this is Hollywood legend at this point. So is that they were going to do it anyway, and he thought, well, I better do it so they don't screw it up too bad. Right, and and. So well, the interviews I've read, he's a he's a comic fan and he's a huge Watchmen fan. He's a huge so nerd. he said, "I want to do it." And he, and from the first couple of production stills, you saw you saw them recreating at least the look of the world. Do you remember that 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 leaked still of Rorschach? With the, yeah. remember it was like the camera was down here and it was the city, and then there was, was a that video, one. Wasn't it? It was video, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, it was, it was a video. It was a, was a flash in that three hundred trailer. Yeah, he was playing yeah. a shot of Rorschach. So Zack Snyder, who who did a great job in three hundred, has, has directed the movie. The movie's opening. And um, you know, not a lot of stars are in. I think the biggest star is Billy Crudup. I think is Doctor Manhattan. Um, you know, the guy from Grey's Anatomy. He's the the shaved and blue. So yeah. the guy from Grey's Jeffrey Anatomy Morgan is the, is the, is the, the comedian. comedian. I just stumbled on that a couple of days ago. I was like, hey, it's the Grey's. It's Denny. It's Denny <laughs> Duquette. Um, now it's funny because you know, the, uh, at all the cons and stuff like that, we talked to a lot of people, and everyone was like, so Watchmen, you nervous? <laughs> and so you come off on the nervous side. Not anymore. I mean, it is. I mean, it's been. Around. I've been. I've had a lot of time to come to it. Like, if 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 it was up to me, ultimately, do I want a movie to get made? Yeah. No. I mean, good for Dave Gibbons for making money. Alan Moore doesn't care. For me, it's 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 a great, 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 great book. Yeah, and the only thing that I would worry about was a really shitty movie making people not respect the book. Right. But isn't it really great that this movie, just based on the trailer, has sold hundreds of thousands of copies? That of the is book? great. Yeah. However, it, like I said, like, it's well, t- the thing is, it's not going to be Electra. It's not going to be. No, it, it isn't. Yeah, yeah. But it's a tough book. Right. Like, and and the thing is, but it's that, great like, if it's I'm, making people read this greatest thing that we've ever done as an industry. We. Well, yeah, I, I totally lettered this book. Right? <laughs> I mean, like, I consider you know comic books part of my life. I, right. you know. I know, I know what you mean. But the thing is that, and it's funny because I was the same way where I'm like, ah, uh, you know. But the trailer got me really excited. The only thing that worries me is, and what we talked about is that the you know Night Owl looks a little Batman Schumachery. You know, well, that's like the, part of the, the, the costume. Deconstruction of yeah. deconstruction the movie. My yeah. professional name is Dave Kippins. Nice. Wow. <laughs> he pulls the mask <laughs> off. Can you do me a sketch? But, um, Perhaps after the show. Shoe enough, Mike. So I'm a little nervous about it, but I saw the trailer, and I thought the trailer was awesome. I mean, it looked, I mean, the, the, the Mars, the, the watch building that Dr. Manhattan makes on Mars looks amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the comedian looks great. They're, they're, again, like 300, there are shots that we've seen in the trailer and that we'll see in the movie that are directly lifted from the artwork. And Dib- Gibbons has been involved in the movie. He's, so he claims he loves it. He, he's talked to Brett highly all we can do is cross our fingers. I mean, it's but. not going to be the book, and that's that's the most important thing. Right. To go into you yep. just understand it and take it as a different thing. I enjoyed *Beat for Vendetta*. Yes, yeah, so it's it very different from the book, but I thought yeah. it was a good movie. Yeah. I took the yeah. ideas of it. Yeah. And the funny thing about reading this recently is that I was going through it, going, "All right, this could probably be cut." Yeah. This, mm-hmm. this probably won't make it. Like stuff yeah. you going through, like editing in my head, thinking, right, "This is this." What would you do? This. What would you? I kind of like *The Lord of the Rings*. I still yeah. recommend though, if you haven't read the book, try to read it before you go to the movie. Just you see, I wanted to read it after the movie. No, but you've read it before. You should have that one experience of reading it and putting your own voices in the people's heads. Yeah. And seeing it the way that it is, it you know the way it was originally intended yeah. because you know now nobody's going to be able to read Lord of the Rings for the first time without hearing Red you know Viggo Mortensen. Yeah, but they shouldn't get them up. Um, One thing that's interesting about that is that is the, in the book the story itself, Rorschach's identity is a mystery. Nobody knows. Yeah. Nobody. Not even the other heroes know who he is yeah. and what he looks like. And then, <laughs> well, now you've ruined it for the people. Put a big spoiler bug. Yeah. But there's several people on that page. Um, yeah. <laughs> So in the movie, everyone will know who he is right away because yeah. people know who he's been cast. But it's like yeah. I, I forgot that it was until halfway through the yeah. book you don't know yeah. who's actually. It was Rorschach. a great reveal. Um, so we're so excited for the movie coming out uh, that we made a little thing that we want to share with everybody. If you go to I, if you go to ifanboy.com forward slash store, you can see you can buy a limited edition T-shirt that's uh, says Herm. 
Herm. Which is uh, a which is a uh, the greatest line in the book. The greatest line in the comics, actually. Uh, the shirt is not affiliated with the Watchmen at all, or DC Comics, <laughs> or Warner Brothers. It doesn't have anything like to do with it. It doesn't have anything to do with it. But we just thought we'd bring it up randomly in the yeah, show. Yeah, If you like the font Futura, you'll like this shirt. <laughs> so, um, so go to store. So iFanboy.com forward slash store. Check it out. But if you have an opinion of the Watchmen, or you want to you know share a story that you heard that we didn't talk about or something, you can shoot us an email at contact at iFanboy.com. You can call 888-FANBOYS, which is 326-2697. That's our voicemail line. You can, you can leave any, uh, any thoughts, questions, questions for the podcast, things like that. Tell us what you think of the movie. Yep. Yeah. And you can do all that at iFanboy.com. That's where you can find the discussion on this show, as well as you can find that Herm shirt. That's something we, ran, we randomly brought up for no apparent reason. And you can go to reverse3.com slash iFanboy. There you can find our forums. We talk about the show there also, and other, as well as other comic book things. There'll be a lot of discussion on the movie. And if I have any piece of advice, it's not to read the Rorschach chapter right before bed. I did that. <laughs> That's a good that idea. That was a mistake. Yeah, that's a good there idea. Are, um, right now, there are approximately 190 other things we could talk about about this book. We can keep going. I can it go on so for good. days. I actually read the pirate part this time. Did oh, you? Oh, you did? Yeah. It was great, oh, wow. wasn't it? For you longtime iFanboy audience members, you know how important that is. <laughs> I decided I was going to read everything in the book this time. And did you like it? Yeah. I need to read it again. It's literally the first time I've ever read it, so wow. I, it didn't. So. But that was like panels within a page, so you skip around the like newsstand page. Just skip the... Oh, really? Jeez. Yeah. Well, good. I'm proud. Hope you like the movie. Read the book. Her. Her. Not <laughs> <laughs>